Whoops. Welcome, Chameleon Academy. Wow, we have a lot of people here today. And I want to introduce you to everybody. Oh, wonderful. Uh, let's see, we've got uh, Peter's in the house, Peter Nechas. You want to say hello to everybody? And then we've got James Cross up there. Hi, everyone. And then Sean McZoo McNeely. Hello again. And uh, wonderful. We've got people coming into the uh, the chat here. Uh, Jenny from Germany. Hello, Jenny. Very good to see you. And uh, Eliza, she, she's been around a lot. And then we have uh, Leaf with Eyes. Oh, I'm going to say that's Gabriel or Miguel. Uh, I keep I keep uh, trying to remember these names. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Howard. Hello, Genevieve. Okay, we've got a great crew coming on. So today we are going to be talking about fogging. This is a, uh, it's not a new technique, but it's relatively new to the mainstream. And so we're going to have to uh, talk about what it is and, uh, and uh, how we should transition into it. And uh, I would like to start this off by uh, introducing, uh, having each one introduce themselves and then talk about how they got introduced to this whole fogging technique. Uh, Peter, could you start us off? Of course, I will start with pleasure. Uh, well, so I, I guess uh, the Caminian community might have some idea who I am. I'm a biologist uh, by education and, and deep in my heart. And for more than 35 years, I, I follow the uh, masters of disguise, which uh, cannot hide uh, in front of me. And I uh, unleash and reveal uh, their secrets of their lives and uh, bring good tidings to mankind about many very interesting aspects of their life where we can learn from them for many, many purposes, be it uh, for the obvious reason, which, which we have uh, today now here, uh, how to make sure that the chameleons, that we uh, have the, uh, I would say, courage or even um, maybe um, it would be another word uh, to uh, to enslave them and to, uh, you know, get them from the wild to the captivity. How can we provide them such a um, environment that they pardon us uh, and they they live and thrive and reproduce and build strong uh, lineages of captive population of their kind in, in captivity. Uh, I, of course, study captives also for myself and, and for the mankind as, as such, because uh, some of the aspects, and I believe that even fogging is one of these aspects, is where the chameleons, thanks to their special biology and special setup of their features, you know, are extremely sensitive and extremely good example and model organism to understand more about how we humans interact with each other, with the mother nature uh, on, the, on the entire planet, uh, because uh, I believe that we should and we can care for our planet and and comedians are my friends that help me you know to find the arguments uh, for that uh, be it on the on the level of of Chameleon enthusiasts or on uh, on the level of a biologist or, or people in general this is this is my mission okay uh sean how about you um i've been fogging um i i guess i've been doing chameleons for like 20 or 30 years um, but I've been fogging for probably four or five years. I was just looking through my pictures and I saw something um, early 2019 uh, with me actually in a video showing how I was fogging different things. So it's been a long while that I've been fogging them. I've been fogging the, those creatures uh, in different ways. I, I you know, I, I do uh, the three main types of uh, hydration strategies. I do use the misters. I use the foggers and I'm using the drippers, whether I... Uh, put an actual dripper on or I put a, 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 a ice cube on top of the cage and let it melt it just to, for extra hydration. But um, I've been doing all this for many, many years. So it uh, seems like it's not a new thing to me, but um, for many people, I understand this is new and exciting and, uh, and different. So I'd encourage you to try it, um, you know, whatever way you want it to. Okay. And James? Well, I um, started out in chameleons back in the early 80s. I've uh, been doing it since I was a kid with my wife. Um, of course, we lost a lot of chameleons because we didn't do 
we didn't have the internet. We didn't have any way of figuring this stuff out. And I'm kind of new to social media. Um, I never put two and two together. So I still was kind of a little behind the times until I found um, Peter and Bill's uh, uh, information on the internet and uh, started implementing some of their strategies. And uh, um, fogging became literally the mainstay of what I'm doing. Okay. Now, the uh, one reason why uh, Sean and James are so important to this particular episode is that uh, they listened to the, the ideas of fogging, they implemented it, and Sean is doing it on hatchlings, and James is doing it on Parsons chameleons. And of course, hatchlings are the most sensitive, and Parsons chameleons, along with Mellers, are, are, are accused of being water guzzlers, and that's all they want to do. And so to be able to hydrate them effectively, uh, it should be very easy to tell if it's working or not. And so uh, I, that is why they are here. Uh, but I'd like to start from the beginning. Peter, uh, in, in we've, we've, of course, had a big, long interview and so people can listen to a couple of hours of us talking about it but for the sake of this particular episode can you encapsulate the uh what inspired you to say hey wait a minute it might be fogging may be a thing it might be their hydration well i, I will try to make the story short in spite of the thing it's, yeah, it's try. Actually a, a big part of my life and my question uh uh, let us let's start from from the question what actually hydration is you know um, like hydration is a process of providing the proper amount of water to any organism as we speak about chameleons of course for chameleons as such chameleons are special uh, they're especially even among uh, reptiles in having their bodies almost perfectly isolated against water gain and against water loss so the entire uh, surface of, of, of their body is actually impenetrable by water, you know, so that uh, practices like, you know, soaking chameleon in, in the water or trying to do something what we can do with iguanas, like, you know, uh, relying on hydration via cloaca and the resorption of water simply does not work in chameleons. They are like a piece of plastic. OK, so uh, from that perspective, they bring, uh, they, they are quite a nice model of uh, how we can actually see what, what hydration means. So it is proper amount of water inside of the body so that all the mechanisms inside of the body, all the uh, complex enzymes and then chemicals, you know, work proper in the digestion and in the metabolic processes. If, if the water is too much, the, uh, the um, uh, efficient uh, uh, processes get uh, stuck or get uh, get get slow slowed down because the concentration of the enzymes is too low and people uh, and the chemicals cannot for instance digest or or lots of uh, processes uh, do not work uh, as such and if there's not enough water you you can imagine that water is really like uh, an essential a nutrient for, for all organisms uh, be it uh, bacteria uh, up, up to up to ours as humans then lack of water is also influencing influencing us very badly so the main question is actually for me always to to, to see it globally and then then to uh, like uh, separate it in, in specific questions the main question is how can we gain that balance and the balance uh, is, is get through two processes of course the water intake and the water expelling you know how chameleons can expel water they do it in two ways actually only they poop and and uh, of, of course they, they give uh, urine or urates out of the body which contain a little bit of water and you know that they do it very efficiently to to reabsorb any possible amount of water from the feces so that in in ideal uh, situations it may be some uh, examples of the of the really uh chameleons coming from the moist forests you get droppings which are dry in such an extent that you can really like you know, smash them in the fingers and then get get something like a powder okay and the second way how they can lose actually water is that they breathe it out 
uh, as a part of the gases that, that, that they, they simply uh, use for exhaling. Okay. Uh, on the other side, the uh, mechanism how they can gain the water, and this is actually our, our the target now and our main topic is how can they get the water from outside inside? And we know, of course, obviously, that they, and let us start with the uh, like less spectacular thing, they eat. It means they feed on feeders, which are animals, be it insects or be it small vertebrates, whatever, be it snails, okay, which uh, have a substantial part of their bodies built by water. It ranges from 20 to uh, over 90 percent. Okay, so while they are eating, they are hydrated. It's first mechanism. Second mechanism, which we know very well from the captivity, is actually that they drink. Yeah, they run uh, after some uh, droplets of waters. They lick it up and they swallow them, like we see it in, in all other vertebrates, including humans. Uh, then they, of course, have some uh, some metabolic gain because the citrus cycle uh, in which the metabolism is, is, is working has as a side uh, product uh, molecules of water and they gain some water also from, from digestion as, as such. And, and I found out that actually this might not be enough. That might not be enough because if you use only these mechanisms, the chemicals can get very easily de de dehydrated. So the last big question mark was how they can get uh, hydrated other ways. And I found out that one of the hydration methods, uh, and, and I mean it, hydration, it means how they gain water and attach it to the inner issues, the tissues, is while breathing in very uh, uh, humid air, specifically uh, breathing in um, the fog. And to make the st story short, uh, I came from one observation which I made within my uh, like many the, like decades of, of research out there in the wild, including all of Africa, India, um, um, the Arabia, you name it, including the territories where the chemicals have been introduced. I have uh, I have had a, a shocking um, uh, experience where I found out that actually I did not see except of all the other uh, phenomena that, that chemicals do from, from uh, you know, pair bonding through uh, running after each other, killing each other, eating each other, pooping, uh, the, like laying eggs and so on. I have never seen them licking liquid water in the wild. And it was a shock for me. So I said, like, hey, Peter, I do, I, either you are crazy and, and you bias it or there is something on it, and I did my research very properly, and we described the the steps of the research uh, together with Bill in in the previous episodes. Uh, and to make the story short, is it is obvious now, and it's actually a scientifically and practically proven fact that chameleons, beside of eating, uh, drinking liquid water, and metabolic gain, are dependent in their life on. Uh, getting substantial amounts of water through inhaling moist air, which is actually so moist that it cannot hold the moist inside and droplets of tiny uh, little pieces of, of, of water, uh, which, we, which we perceive and name as fog or mist, you know, uh, build the substance which they inhale. And because they do it mainly at night, because this is the time when the fog is uh, present in their environment, they get hydrated through this way. And the whole process of, uh, of uh, getting balanced in terms of uh, getting hydrated properly is actually driven by the night fogging, which uh, the uh, dear God does uh, every day for, 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 for them for free. And we do it with our very complex devices and uh, using electricity and piezoelectric crystals and so on and so on, providing fog of same or very, uh, very um, similar quality of what they find in, in, in the night nature. And we can then uh, take the uh, logic that it Let's say I found uh, based uh, on the scientific base in the wild four in the captivity and can uh, build one of their lives uh, comfortable in providing them the same logic of hydration like uh, what they experience for millions and millions of years out there in the wild 
where they live and thrive and reproduce for centuries and, and millions of years, uh, same as what we would like to see them in captivity. Okay, thank you. Now, Sean, when you first started fogging, I mean, this is something that I, uh, uh, I think it was in 2018 that I started putting it on the podcast with some interviews with Peter and mm -hmm. uh, my own. And so at that time, uh, you came to, uh, you started thinking, okay, I can do this on hatchlings. Now we know that we're all very nervous about hatchlings. They're the most sensitive. And so what was your thinking as to, Hey, I'm going to be doing this, uh, with hatchlings. And what did you, what steps did you put in place to make sure that everything was safe? I mean, this is a new technique. Sure. Um, I guess the back when I actually heard your podcast, that's when I started fogging. Um, I used it actually on my, um, my adult chameleons. Um, I actually used it in a, a hybrid cage and I learned very quickly that you have to adjust it because, uh, you can uh, f over fog a uh, room or what have you. One, one night in the, mo in the middle of the night, three o'clock in the morning, I got up and I went down to my basement where everything is at. And it was actually raining in there because I was fogging with so many fog machines. So my babies were getting so much fog that, um, that there was a rain cloud in my basement that you can imagine three o'clock in the morning, rain cloud in my basement thinking, oh my gosh, maybe I'm over fogging. <laughs> but um, I turned down the foggers. Um, luckily, I didn't get any mold a after that point because I, for some reason, I got up and uh, and uh, decided to do it. But um, I just thought, you know, what is what what um, misting babies seems like a bad idea. You, you, I misted them with my hands and I hand misted them, and um, I went to um, you know to doing hand misting, and I and I actually have not until recently put a mist king um, on my babies before. Um, but I did fog from the very beginning. Um, first time I had babies, I thought, well, you know, fogging, it's natural. It's the way to do it. Um, why not do it? I, I did start to hand mist. Um, but I found out that in the morning when I came in after the night of fogging, I fogged from midnight to 6 a.m. I fog different amounts of time based on the time of year because I'm in Ohio and our weather is different. And they're in my basement and in the depth of winter and in the middle of the summer, it's actually cool and dry down there because winter it's cold and the heat is on and summer my air conditioning is on so it takes all the moisture out of the air the spring and the fall um it's very moist down there um and so i don't have to fog quite as much so i adjust the fog based on that but um i come downstairs in the morning and i go to spray and i'm like the whole cage is covered with mist because the fog collected as the as the morning started and so the babies have already had their 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 missing and what have you so then i stopped missing in the morning and was only misting at night and then um after a while um it, i got to, to the point where i missed a day or two and nothing happened and so they did okay so i kept fogging and, and that was all i was doing and it seemed to work very well and so um i don't uh you know i didn't um put any drippers on my babies at first because i you know i just didn't seem to think that they looked okay they didn't seem to have any signs of dehydration their poop was normal um like that's so the, the way you can check anything you know i think here we uh we uh we love our poop um we, right. when your poop is normal everything is good i mean it's that's crazy because you know that's just the way humans are as well you know you start off as a baby um people worry about you know the poop and as you're as you're on your way out the door um you, you're still worrying about poop so i think we're all poop obsessed but uh nonetheless the poop was nice it was good it seemed to be working well they grew up um, they grew up fast and they grew up big and they grew up healthy and I was able to send them out and I actually fogged the first ones I was fogging was Jackson's. I was actually fogging my quadricornis when, when the babies were born and you know how rare those are in, in the United States. Um, and some others, um, Honelli and some others and nothing seemed to have any problems. So I just kept doing it and it's been successful. I, I see, a, I saw, well, I was looking through my pictures to figure out when I did all this stuff. Cause I don't remember. It's been so long ago. Um, but uh, <laughs> fecal elfia, I, I just read in the comment. But, um, yeah. but you know, I was looking at my pictures. 2019, I have pictures of my of my baby cages with a fogger over them. I mean, like, um, so I've been doing it since 2019. Now I've had some starts and stops on babies, and I quit a little bit over the uh, pandemic, um, um, mating my my chameleons because uh, you know you never know when these things are gonna have babies never know when the when the eggs are going to hatch or when the live bears are going to drop their babies so um 
you know, because of the inability to get rid of them um, in a timely manner, I quit for a period of time, but I'm back to doing it again and it's still working. And I, I think it works great. And um, I've never went to the, to the depth that uh, Peter went to. I never really measured them before bed and measured them in the morning, but that's, that's, um, you know, very scientific. It's done with everything else. You know, we do it with newborn infants who are in the NICU. We, you know, that we, uh, we, we, you know, we can't figure out how much, you know, they nurse when they nurse and then they're nursing. So you weigh them before they nurse, you weigh them after they nurse and you see if they've changed their weight. Why not do that for babies for, for the, for the, uh, for water. So that, that's awesome. I'm going to probably try to do that. Uh, with my, I with I have a couple of clutches of panthers and I actually have some uh, clutches of brevicorn that, um, were wild caught moms that came in and laid eggs and I incubated the eggs and, uh, they've, they've grown up and they're, uh, couple months now so i'll probably try to do that uh weigh them and see what they weigh afterwards so give some more data to the to the whole thing okay now james this yeah. is uh <laughs> we'd really like to hear your experience because okay we can imagine fogging would hydrate a baby because it's small but a parsons chameleon uh that is a huge test can it hydrate a parsons chameleon so very much like to hear your experience well i've I had a couple of panthers and I was just doing misting. Um, and then I started listening to some of the stuff Peter and you were putting out about this fogging. Um, and so I implemented a fogger in a panther cage. Um, but I don't know that I was doing it correctly. I just was kind of winging it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not as uh, PhD orientated as Peter or, uh, or, been doing it like you have bill but um you know i'm just a carpenter who loves these animals passionately anyway we um it started working it seemed to be working um i had no more dry poops um you know on occasion with the panthers i would have um you know times they would be dry and then there would be times where that they would be super moist and i i attribute that more to the misters and them getting access to drinking and they were drinking. I was watching them drink off the plants. Um, and so I kind of thought that was the normal thing. Well, Primo Chameleons gave me the opportunity to pick up my first Parsons. And, uh, you know, when you spend that kind of money, it's time to do some serious research. Um, and um, But it's an animal that I had wanted all my life. Um, and so I really delved in deep to f information looking at the fogging situation. And so I ended up building a cage ahead of time um, with all the perimeters and ideas that I took from your podcast, from Peter's pages, um, and I started trying to implement them in the cage. Um, I got a couple of months to uh, do all of this research before the baby was ready or before I was able to purchase it. Well, so I had a cage set up and I started doing the fogging the minute the animal got home. In the beginning, she was she was drinking a little bit of water. Um, I was probably going through 10 to 20 gallons of water a week in my cages. Um, you know, that means several bucket dumps. Um, but literally within the first month, she all of a sudden stopped drinking. Um, and I, I, I almost couldn't believe it because I'm so used to chameleons drinking off the leaves at least once or twice a day. Yeah, by the way, um, I still can't believe it, even though I'm seeing it. But, uh, you yeah, know, go on. You know, so then I start. So, of course, I did this set up a camera. OK, because this just can't be, you know. Um, so I set up a camera and I'll be a son of a gun. She's not drinking. Her poops are perfect. What the hell's going on? So then I acquired another Parsons, a male. Um, and I've been doing it for about a year now. My chameleons don't drink. Uh, my female may mouth at the water sometimes, but I think it's more of like she's taking a bath. I don't think she's really drinking. Um, it only happens every once in a while, but 90% of the time, they're not drinking. Um, so I've been able to cut my misting back immensely. Um, I'm dumping buckets instead of every day to maybe on Friday. Okay. Um, so it's amazing and they are fully hydrated they're bright-eyed and bushy tail and i just i'm just so pleased with the results um I, I don't know why people aren't doing it to be honest with you 
Um, the, inf- the you guys are giving us the information. What the heck? Give it a try. Yeah, you know? I, I think the reason people aren't doing it is because it is completely foreign to the human experience, and we love our chameleons so much that we don't want to risk it. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I can understand why it's a really tough thing to switch to. <coughs> Um, now, uh, people in the chat, we are going to be taking questions and interactive and, and, and then, uh, right. I'm going to have one more question that I want to ask everybody and then go ahead and put in the questions and Richard, we're going to get to your question first. Uh, but I would like to, uh, address, uh, you three, the, for people wanting to start fogging, there is always a way that you can mess it up and it can be a health risk whether it's misting dripping anything we do uvb heat lamp what they need we can screw it up and harm our chameleon because i mean that's just the nature of things and so i'd like to ask each one of you what are the things that the uh what insight can you give people wanting to start fogging to make sure how could they screw it up and you know let's just start sean what, what do you think? What, what kind of warning can you give so people don't harm their chameleon? I would say that fogging when it's very warm out because the temperature is going to hold more water in the air and there's going to be more of it. Um, fogging too much um, where you're actually creating rain and mist and you're creating um, you, when you're creating rain and it's actually ruining your your room and you're starting to have um, you're starting to have uh, different types of mold growth or what have you. Um, um, I don't know that there's anything else that you do. I mean, it's just, um, just fogging during the day when it's warm outside and the lights are on is probably the worst thing you could do. Um, but you know, it depends on your relative humidity. If your relative humidity is 10%, you can't go wrong fogging because you're, you're you can't get up to 90%. If your relative humidity is 90% and it's 85 degrees out, you better not be fogging and you better be running a, a dehumidifier. Um, because fogging is still just a way to get humidity into the creature. And, you know, I use all three methods um, still all the time, although I just depend mostly on my fogging. Um, but um, when it comes to the um, spring and the, and the fall, I reduce my number of hours of fogging and I use less um, humidity. Um, I guess that, that's all I can see. That's the, only, the, only, the only other thing I, I can tell you is, when I was fogging in a glass container, you can create a whole lot of fog in a small period of time and you can't, there's no air movement. And so if you're not using a fan or moving the air somehow, that's a way to uh, kill a chameleon as well. Because the, even though the, it could be cool, uh, but you're, you're actually fogging water, you're actually dumping water instead of fog in it because it's not, it has nowhere to get out. So those are the three things I've done wrong, I guess. So I, I fogged too much in the sense that I made my room um, inhospitable for me and for the chameleons eventually. I fogged when it was too warm um, and figured out that that causes um, trouble with the chameleons because that, that causes, there's, you can get so much moisture into your air that fogging is not a good idea. And, um, and fogging in a container that um, is so much different than the room itself that it's a, con- a contained container with glass. That's that's the third thing I did wrong. So I've done all those, th- many of those mistakes. Please don't do those things. Um, try not to do that. Um, learn from my mistakes. But um, but I'm here to say that I'm fogging everything all the time. Every night I fog from midnight till six or seven a.m. and I do it intermittently when it's when it's moisture out. I do it all night when it's less moist. And in my basement, it's cool. I have Montaigne, so it's always in the low 60s, middle 60s, um, every night, even in the summer and winter, because of the way I keep my basement. Um, so I never get into that area where it's 90 degrees and I'm fogging, which doesn't make any sense. Okay, James, what were your um, experiences? Temperature is definitely the key. Uh, I would not even consider fogging during the day. Any temperature over 70 degrees, I think it's too hot. Um, I try to keep my temperatures. I don't like my fogger running unless it's 65 or below. Um, I think that, um, when I first started doing my Panther, I wasn't doing it correctly. She did. He did show some signs that I thought were RFI. I think what 
or, I mean, RI, respiratory infection. I think that um, the problem was is that I implemented it too quickly. Um, I gave him too much fog right out of the gate. And um, so I kind of backed that off just a little bit and I refined it to the nighttime temperatures. And um, I think those are the key factors right there, to be honest with you. You know, it's definitely temperature. You know, he, Sean says air circulation. I think a little air movement is fine. Stagnant air is more of, I think, a problem when it's hot than when it's cold. Um, I also implemented everything I'm doing now is in, in hybrid cages. Screen cages just don't work. Okay. In my area, anyway. Our temperatures here, I mean, we have... Z I'm in California, but we don't have any humidity. Yeah. So yes. we make our own. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go ahead now, uh, uh, my perspective, and then Peter is going to pull it all together, and then we're going to get to uh, the questions that are in the chat. Uh, the one thing that I would su suggest to be careful of as a way you could mess things up with fogging is our, usually the foggers that we have have these tubes, and so you get the fog sh uh, shooting out of the tube. Getting very close to that tube is 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 a draft you've got a cold draft coming out it's just mm -hmm. like being too close to the heat lamp you're going to get burned too close to uvb too much uvb this is just a, a function of us having to artificially create something in nature uh in nature the chameleon is sitting on his his perch and the cloud comes to the chameleon it's a very gentle thing that happens around them it's not a stream of fog that shoots out at them so we need to uh one way you can mess it up is by having the fogger too close to your chameleon so you want it to dissipate before the chameleon is enveloped in it this becomes very relevant if you're trying to do this in a screen cage in a hybrid cage yes the it's very easy for the uh, fogger to be far away and to create a cloud that the chameleon can just uh, be enveloped in in a screen cage you're going to have a thin tube of fog coming out and the chameleon eventually very quickly actually will find where that tube is of fog that cone of fog and will sleep in that cone of fog because they they want that moisture you need to make sure that they can get to that cone of fog without being too close to the source of the fog and so what i suggest doing is put your fogger in the place that you want it and then see how far down the fog goes and create perching areas down at the bottom of that fog cone so they don't fall asleep and then get a draft because that will cause respiratory infection uh so that's my hint all right peter go ahead and tie this all together so um guys you have named the the, the most important things you know uh of course uh it all is totally in line with my observation in, in the in the wild you know you have you, you cannot actually have fog above 17 degrees it is technically and physically impossible yeah so it does not happen so we cannot expose our our little creatures if we love them as james lovely said yeah like if we are passionate about it we cannot give them something that might harm them so above 70 in the wild it never happens so we cannot do it in, in the in the captivity so temperature is really one of the keys the second is uh, what, what you said as well like uh it is not the question fog or no fog this is like the 50 shades of of gray you know it is it is still <laughs> you know and, and of course you know i don't think that's the same peter <laughs> but, but, but okay discussed, you know so that so that they get the, the right amount and the right amount uh, again what what is the right amount right amount we can measure actually on long term very precisely in observing their poop and observing their urates it's it's so easy you know and it is so nicely um like uh shown by them that you, you really uh, usually do not need to to wait for another one you just take the one and say okay too much okay let us reduce and again but let us get back to the, the, the mother nature uh is there uh fog 
24 uh, hours um, uh, per day. No, it is mostly there in the night time. It's very rare at the daytime. And if then it is uh, confined to the early morning where the temperatures are low, it's first uh, heavy um, uh, fog almost never happens for many hours in a row. So it is the, 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 the fog is usually coming and going specifically for these montane chameleons that live on on high mountains you know the fog starts with a cloud above the highest peak of the mountains and during the night while the temperature uh, goes uh, goes down the, the cloud goes down 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 now now it comes to the place where the chameleon sits stays there for two hours and then it is below where the chameleon sits so it goes away and towards the morning, it is again raising up. So the chameleon again gets maybe two hours of dense fog, which is then slowly disappearing and coming in and then going. So let us do the same. It is so easy with our devices, with the timers and, and with all the switchers and, and uh, the, the, like uh, sensors that we can build in to make also the, the variability proper so that we do not overexpose them to too much as also Bill very correctly, very correctly said. And let us really always think uh, like, focused on the factor that we are discussing and uh, taking it into consideration the whole environment which is of course multifunctional and multi um, uh, functionality means that all the tiny things influence each other like it was uh, perfectly explained by, by, by sean and james and bill if it comes to for instance the ventilation you know it is a completely different case if you have a uh, screen cage uh, or if you have a a glass cage and if it is at in the basement if it is outside and so on and so on, let's consider the things holistically now to add my grain of salt into the discussion uh i i would like to be a little bit controversial <laughs> and answer what? your question no uh, wait wait <laughs> a minute big surprise <laughs> look my point is that actually the big biggest mess you can do is actually not to fog you know not to give the chameleon what it needs uh you know people of course uh, people that are a little bit more uh, on the side of being cautious you know being careful uh, not doing new things and not trying new things despite of the fact that science and experience of the others says that it's it's good they always say well i'm i'm i'm, I'm afraid of so be more afraid of not providing fog than of providing fog uh, properly. And I tell you why. You know, first of all, if we do not fog, we revert actually uh, unknowingly or even then knowingly the humidity cycle of the chameleon. We actually, you know, in, in, if you have these solitary chameleons in the cages in the flats, you know, then we have a very low humidity at the night time while we then mist and give water and put there the droppers and drippers and, and put the ice cubes and so on. And we increase the humidity at the daytime while in the, in the uh, wild it is reverse. And if you speak, and we, we, we are uh, almost obsessed with that idea together with Bill, you know, to, to provide the chameleons with a naturalistic way of, 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 of caring for, you know, then to, to swap something is definitely nothing that, 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 that will bring something positive to chameleons. And believe me, I tried to find out what it is. Uh, it is actually uh, one thing. Uh, as many uh, chameleon keepers would, for instance, swear specifically, like James says, for the Parsons or for the Mellers, you know, the huge chameleons that really need lots of water. Why? Because they weight the hell 1.5 kilogram if they are adult, you know, so they really need lots of water to, to, to saturate their, their tissues and then bring their, their um, metabolism on, 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 on the spot. Uh, then what we observe in the captivity is that they are heavy drinker, uh, heavy drinkers. Why? Because if we have two dry nights, then they do not get what they would get actually, and they get even less because they desiccate in the night. So this is why they are so vigorous drinkers because they compensate twice, yeah, the absence. And the low humidity, the two times they absent. This is why they, of course, run after each uh, uh, single uh, drop of water for half a day because they got desiccated and they, they were desperate to get something in which they did not get. 
Now, what happens, you know, if it is like James says, and, and I'm very close with, with, with him, and I tell you one more story uh, sh shortly also. Uh, and he says, once the chameleons get properly hydrated, they stop drinking. It means they do not stop drinking. They drink while inhaling the fog, but they stop drinking in terms of, you know, getting in the liquid water. Now, if this is the standard in the wild, you know, then we have to actually uh, get the idea that drinking is actually unnatural for them. And what does it mean? It means if they are not used to get these three, four milliliters of liquid water to the mouth and swallow it to their intestines. Yeah. So if we force them to do so, we, we harm them. We give them more water that for millions and millions of years, the digestive tract was actually made for. And uh, we see it in, in uh, captivity very often. People ask me about the quality of poop now for, <laughs> for almost a decade, you know. And I explain always, please, the normal poop is black. Black, black, not brown and not gray. And what we get very often from the not fogged chameleons is very smelly uh, poop of uh, the consistency which is not firm not like you know uh like uh, the, the olives or whatever but they are it is soft and and then mushy and fluffy and it is of gray color what does it mean it means that something is i say first uh cautiously different than in the wild because if, you, if in the wild you get black poop and in the captivity you get uh, gray then something is different and i even will be now brave and say something is wrong and indeed something is wrong you know what happens uh it uh, the the same mechanism actually happens if you f uh, like if you fog at very high temperature the uh, cells that are put uh, that, that are actually um, like in contact with all the um, um, uh, feeders and all the content of the gut content, okay? The cells are not plastic. They are very fragile. And what they do is they, they let through the membrane, okay, only water. So it means if this is the, the gut content, okay, and if this is the cell, you know, here we have some salt, okay? And so osmosis, which is a process of, you know, uh, 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 equaling the osmotic pressure, it means of concentration of salt on both sides of a membrane, yeah, is, uh, uh, well, it, it is done like that. The water is here, it is more and less salt. Here is salt and there is less water. So the water goes and penetrates the cell and the cell do, do, does what it grows and grows and grows until the moment that it cannot grow anymore and it ruptures there are tiny little ruptures in the in the intestine and i have already made uh, some histological um, uh, investigations and it happens like that so on the long term if you provide much more water to the intestine, the intestine is flooded by water, the cell rupture, and you get a, say, a state where the chameleon actually, through this necessary rehydration or compensation mechanism of hydration, gets ill. It is not getting a respiratory disease. It is getting a chronic uh, inflammation of the wall of the intestine. If the intestine is... Uh, harmed by that, of course, it cannot metabolize all the nutrients. And you can see it with the first sign on the bad quality of poop. Okay, so if you want to have good quality of poop, please fog them and fog them properly, not too much, but properly because too much liquid water damages actually the processes of the correct digestions. And the same fits actually for uh, my other beloved topic, which is the hemipineal plaques. Uh, many chameleons get these hemipineal plaques, you know. Why they get them? Because they do not get fog. You start fogging chameleon, every single uh, molting process, every single shedding process ends up in, you know, uh, hang uh, of, of these two socks, you know, on some of the branches, you know, uh, of, of a man and everything is proper. 
when the, the moisture is not enough, these uh, organs that need this tiny little moisture to, to, to work properly, do not work properly, retain the, uh, the, the shed inside, and then it happens two, three, four times, and you have a plug that is actually then blocking the hemipenis, causing its inflammation or uh, uh, losing the function and, and can actually lead to big harm of the animal and to its death. So, uh, what, what, once again, my, my grain of salt is not fogging is the biggest hazard of the fogging uh, logic that we that we discuss and if i can take one more minute uh, um, to to just uh, uh give you another uh, story from the wild which will make the story round uh, just just allow me to do so okay. um, i was in kenya studying the three horned uh, giant uh, uh, chameleons jackson's chameleons the uh, the uh, triocerus Santolophus, which are so famous and so popular in the United States. States first, they are big and they are they are majestic. They are little dinosaurs. They are very uh, popular because you get lots of loads from the Hawaii, despite of the fact it's illegal and you cannot do it and so on and so on. Let's not talk about it. And of course, uh, also thanks to uh, Bill and Sean uh, that, that made it happen. Uh, not long ago, you know, to get a very nice and very, uh, like, properly managed uh, load of chemicals directly from Kenya to the U.S. and building a, a, a very nice um, population in captivity that, that originates in the good quality genetic material from, uh, from Kenya. Now, I was studying them uh, in, in their home country, and it was the very end of the dry season, okay? Now... You say, okay, dry season. Dry season means no water, really. Uh, the locals confessed and, and said, hey, I, I really uh, like uh, be sure there was no rain for more than three months. No single drop of water from the skies for three months. Okay? So they could not drink anything. Okay? It was so dry that there was no, uh, no uh, water even on the plants in the morning and in the night time. Yeah, they, they were so, so sort of dry that it was not enough to build dew. Now, I studied the population and say, okay, so logically, end of dry season, they must be dehydrated. So I looked at the, their poop and the poop was normal. I said, Peter, what was that? So uh, again, maybe you, you have to rethink what you are telling because uh, how, it's, how it's possible. The poop was proper, okay? It, it actually was containing more water than I expected. Yeah, it was it was quite quite soft. Yeah, I said okay. What what was the second thing? I looked at other features how to actually find out that the animals are dehydrated that I was expecting. So I I made this you know skin skin fold test. Yeah, skin fold test was perfect. They were hydrated. I opened their mouths. You know. All the saliva were, were normal, but not sticky. All their their uh, insides of the of the, uh, the mouse were uh, uh, like full of normal saliva, so it means moist. Nothing about that dehydration. I I, I searched uh, in the in the eyes of the chameleons. No dehydration. I say, come on. Uh, all the signs of dehydration are absent at the very end of the of the of the dry season, and now the rain came. At that very moment, when I was actually in the middle of the biotope, and I had about ten specimens in my sight distance. Yeah, I really, uh, literally, could see about ten specimens from where I was staying. Yeah. Uh, now that the rain came, and uh, believe me, the, when, when the rain came, comes in, in Africa, it is uh, really uh, the, the, the droplets are like that, They're like like <laughs> quail eggs, you know. So, if the rain comes, the rain comes. I said, okay. So, in theory. They must be very thirsty. It is the end of the dry season. What should they do? And so far, everyone said, yeah, oh, of course, obviously, they would run after each uh, droplets of water. Yeah. And uh, the uh, uh, Peter stand there, watched all the chameleons with big surprise because nothing like this happened. No one of these chameleons paid any attention to any drop of water that was like running down in uh, and, and, and like making the the uh, uh, environment moist on the contrary what they did they turned around and they crawled inside of the bushes where they adopted the sleeping position and they started to sleep 
Okay. What does it mean that even, and we, we are talking about the, the high mountain uh, spe uh, species, it, is, it will not fit to all, yeah? but in general, even in the dry season, it is enough moisture in the air so that the drop of the temperatures at the night time creates enough fog or fog-like substance so that the chameleons stay hydrated. They do not need to drink. So I, I'm not saying that chameleons never drink in the wild. I, I'm far away of, of doing such a stupid, um, stupid uh, statements. Yeah, but I'm really convinced that my original observation: chameleons tend not to drink in the wild. Is absolutely correct, and all the observation that we do in the wild and now in the in the captivity actually are slowly by slowly confirming my my first uh, uh, ideas and hypotheses. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, take some questions. Uh, Richard is asking, is there any relevance to nighttime temperatures during the fogging schedule? And yes, we we uh, did talk about that. Peter addressed that. But let's go ahead and uh, make this question uh, absolutely an action item and relative uh, or relatable. When should we fog and when should we say, oh, we're not going to fog? Uh, what, what's the uh, recipe that uh, people first starting off fogging should follow? And, and Peter, I think this one will yeah, go to yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I take it. <clears throat> Look, uh, any of questions that end up with very precise numbers will be wrong. Yeah, by definition, because we always uh, like uh, are talking about an environment and, and about things which which uh, uh, are related to many factors, not only you know to, to one. So I cannot say until eleven thirty it's okay, and then then not. No, I, you will not hear it from me. What I can tell you is the stories from the uh, from the wild, uh, the 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 story, for instance, from uh, from Nosibe or from the, uh, from the um, coast of uh, uh, Madagascar, just opposite of, of, of Nosibe, uh, is as follows. Uh, you see the first signs of uh, night drop and rays of humidity about one to one and a half hours after the, uh, um, the sunset. It means you, you go through the environment and all the environment is moist. Okay, so there it starts to be moist. And uh, when you wake up and you go for a for a uh, early morning swim, you see the fog that covers actually your view to the beautiful landscape of Madagascar with the Marojeji mountains above there. You cannot see them because they are hidden in fog, fog. and they stay hidden in fog until about nine to 10, 10 o'clock. Okay. Once the temperature raises, yeah, the fog dissolves. Uh, so the general conditions where the fog is coming into question is definitely at night. Uh, is definitely, uh, in my um, uh, strong recommendation, uh, several tens of minutes to hours after the sunset. It means after the lights are switched off. And it can last intermittently yeah, to, to be safe. Uh, until early morning hours before the temperature raises up. And uh, I remember one uh, of our, like my beloved colleagues from uh, from Belgium, uh, Mario Jungmann, that you know all uh, too, yeah, is just fabulous. If 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 uh, if there is one guy that, that can reproduce any species of, of chameleon in the world, and it's Mario, mm -hmm. yeah, I have seen miracles what he's doing, and he's doing it really like over decades, unbelievable. What he is actually doing uh, in, in his basement, he can, like Sean, uh, he can actually maintain quite low temperature because his house, I, I hope I, I can say it, his house is actually sitting in a channel, okay? Mm. In a channel, he's yeah. sitting in the water, okay? So if you drive to his beautiful house from the front, you park your, your car, car in, in front of the house, but from the backyard, you can he can uh, go to the to the job uh, using using a boat so the house is actually you know in a in a basin and he can allow himself uh, specifically now when we get the light out of 
uh, not um, uh, infrared producing uh, light sources like the LED uh, light sources, they do not increase the temperature. He can prolong the fogging uh, period until uh, 9 or 10 uh, in the morning, what he also intermittently de- does. Okay, so this is my general general uh, answer. Uh, if uh, if uh, there would be something that you should uh, look at is what I, what I would say is like wait until the chameleon is sleeping, and then then start with it, and it does not actually make a big difference whether you stop once the light is coming on. In case the temperature is not raising, yeah, uh, you can even follow for for, for a couple of uh, minutes or or even hours when you maintain the temperature at quite low uh, low time if we speak about yemen chameleons this is exactly what happens in yemen uh, i have published uh, pictures uh, of um, of the valleys where these uh, beautiful creatures live and uh, about half a year i visited saudi arabia and i, I saw the same phenomenon uh, in the deep fissured so-called wadis the fog is lasting until 11 a.m Okay, so even to taking it into the morning is something that that I would say should be okay. And uh, to 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 sum, but but to sum it up, I think it is not necessary because in my uh, uh, experiments in the in the captivity, actually, the daily fogging, okay, for more than six hours, usually leads to slight overhydration. So if you really insist and in like whole night fogging every single day, you get you get to the margin where it gets in Europe. It means at the average of, of uh, flat um, humidity at nighttime around 30 percent. Then you get to the margin when even you can overfog your chameleon. So you do not need to prolong it longer. But if you have the, the, the right conditions, you can make even longer. Okay. Uh, uh we're, we're gonna <laughs> all these explanations you, we could go off and uh <laughs> have follow-up questions that would go on forever but i want to get to uh, some of these uh questions here and this is howard in florida he's talking about nighttime temperatures is high and uh I'll let you read the the question uh air has already 60 percent relative humidity cannot saturate the air to create mist cloud is it worth fogging Mm-hmm. Yeah, in my opinion, yeah. no. no. This is this is the edge, and this is actually the situation where I have to. Uh, I, I would make two statements. Eh? One is, these are conditions that you never find in in the wild, and this is why you should not actually like uh, fog at these temperatures. Uh, it means that if you find a compensating mechanism that is fine with your chameleon, you still can keep it. But frankly, for, for me myself, the chameleons that, 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 that would suffer from this combination of, uh, of features, I would rather say, hey, take an, an old egg, take another fantastic uh, other uh, creature that will live within this span of... Uh, of factors uh, happily and don't go for the chameleon if you want uh, to really fulfill all the uh, conditions that, that we set for the naturalistic responsible uh, chameleon, chameleon culture. But isn't this the kind of conditions that we find in Fort Myers? Uh, it is uh, actually not in Fort Myers. It's it's quite well, like, look, um, it is again, uh, it is not all uh, every day uh, the, the, the same temperatures and it is not all uh, the, the time the same. I remember Fort Myers to be so chilly that it was definitely uh, below below 70 degrees. 65, you, you get there very easily. And of course, the chameleons uh, uh, can sort of adjust. Same like they can adjust as, as, as you uh, impressively show that they, they find the, the tiny um, like um, uh, oh. like yeah, waterfall of the fog and they, they get there. Uh, the same they can do if they are in the so-called wild in, 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 in uh, the southern, southern um, Florida. And they might find, for instance, less foggy 
and the more airy and uh, areas with more air movements where they can survive even these conditions which are not ideal yeah for a couple of weeks or months but waiting to get back to their physiological norm yeah uh, so that they can like uh, recreate again uh, the, the the powers and and, and get back to the uh, get back to the norm if it is out of the edge of their uh, tolerance they would die yeah if they survive they can for a certain period of time do so yeah like like sean said like, about the jacksons you know yeah uh, i say to all people please don't keep them above 80. yeah you can keep them above 80 for for one month yeah then they die you know so they have a certain tolerance yeah but if you if you miss it up then then they start like showing us uh, the signs of death and not of life and which is not uh, for which uh, for what we are here okay and let's talk about UK, we, uh, there is a, a great resistance to fogging in the UK, uh, and and I know that you get a lot of they get a lot of fog anyways in the UK. So uh, let, let's go ahead and do this question from the UK: Is foggy worth it, or should I stick to three times misting a day? Uh, and I well, I'll say, uh, well, what was the poop look like if uh, if you have high humidity already during the night because you're in the uk maybe you have I, I don't know if you have the windows open is it really that high humidity in the uh in the space where your chameleon is uh how does how does the poop look do you need more uh misting during the day what kind of cage do they have them in you know because in the uk um and all over europe they're 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 more fond of glass so even then it might be uh it might have something to do with whether you fog or not, but I still would fog with glass. I just do it at a lower, at a lower amount. Um, but it's still, um, and, and if, you know, like the same conditions, if you're still, if you're getting fog naturally, you don't need to fog, put fog into the, into the air. Um, it's, it's, it's a matter of, um, of what are you getting and how, how hydrated are your chameleons? And so I think that's the important yeah. question. Yeah. I, I think in, if fogging is, a tool just like any other tool and so it's it's really a condition that we are trying to replicate and if you are able to replicate that with your normal environment then two thumbs up you are further ahead than a lot of us mm -hmm. and so embrace that and enjoy that uh so when we're we're up here we're all talking about how great fogging is it's not because fogging itself has some sort of magic properties it is that it's a tool that allows us to create a natural condition and most of us have to use that tool because we're not in madagascar and or in the mountains of yemen yeah when you're in a dry environment you cannot produce the humidity then then fogging is a key if you live in in a tropical situation then i don't see why you would even consider fogging it's like the beach, right? I mean, if you go to the beach in the winter time, what what's what's the weather like? Well, you're you're fogged in, right? But if it's the summertime and it warms up, the fog dissipates. I I don't know. That's how I came to all of my conclusions. It it's pretty much what natural environments are, you know. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I think that's, you're, you're that's right how on I there, feel, Billy. you know. Yeah, maybe, yeah. you know, one, one of the you were... is the approach, the general approach, you know. Always when I'm asked about any instrument or any technical tool, whether it's good or not on black and white, um, like, uh, suggestion, I hesitate to give it, yeah. We as educators with, with Bill, uh, we, we face lots of big problems in, in what we are saying because we, we have different enclaves of our uh, audition yeah we have uh, a huge amount of people that are uh, simply not uh, experienced enough you know they are beginners and for the beginners we must uh, deliver uh, uh, from time to time very black and white answers so that in the first footsteps during the husbandry they do not make fatal errors okay but if we are now speaking about real uh, life and, and complex uh, condition don't ask me whether you should or not not, not should um, um, fog the proper question is 
what is the way how I create the necessary conditions for my chameleon, which means how I make sure that inside of the cage, which is within some environment which is around, I can, you know, make the trade off of the temperatures and humidities and, and uh, water flow and uh, airflow and so on in such a proper way that inside I have what I require. And this is exactly what James says, you know, if you live in the UK, in the central London, in the 15th floor, and your nighttime humidity is 30%, okay, then you need fogging, but you make to, need to make sure that your temperature is uh, below 65 Fahrenheit. If you live in southern England, uh, like uh, some of my friends do, and use uh, outside cages, and you use use really like the the free uh, 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 like outdoors caging, you know, then you do not need to do anything. You just expose for nine out of twelve months the chameleons to the environment you have because this is for Jackson's almost perfect, you know. And the three months where you can get frosts and 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 can get too cold temperatures, you put them inside and you you uh, like let them. Sleep for instance. You cannot answer, should I fog or should I not? You have to answer, how can I use fogging, you know, to prepare exactly the environment that I need for the chameleons, uh, adjusting to the general uh, temperatures and humidities that I have around. This is this is the trick. Okay. Here we have a question from Garth's Reptile Care. Started my panther on a fogging regimen from one in the morning to around for around three hours. I feel inclined to continue simulating sporadic rainfall events with a dripping system. What are your thoughts? Uh, and I will, I'll throw my thoughts on there. And the question is why? Uh, and that is something that we ask no matter what tool we use. Like we just had a big conversation. Why would you use fogging? Would you? Uh, and the answer is, do you need to? And so it's the same thing we ask in this case. Do you need to have sporadic rainfall? Why? Uh, if you, uh, so say you do the fogging and then you do the rainfall, does the chameleon drink from the rainfall? Does it need to? If it needs to, then yeah, there, there's something that needs to be changed. If you, you're the poop's dehydrated or it's showing signs of dehydration, which running to the raindrops would be a sign of dehydration and that the fogging as implemented isn't working. So yeah, there's a reason for it. But if the chameleon's ignoring the dripping of the rainfall that you have in the afternoon, then it's not necessary for your chameleon's hydration. Uh, if you look at my Chameleon Academy hydration uh, schedule that was specifically designed to have three different fail stops. So if you mess up one thing, there's two things that are backing it up. I have fogging in there. I have misting in there. And then I have a dripper in the afternoon. The uh, And really what I'm using right now is just fogging. But I have that. So if the fogging doesn't work, well, the misting before and after the fogging make sure that there's a layer of dew. Okay, so say you fog and the, the humidity is so low that there's no condensation on the leaves. Well, the misting after the fogging ends takes care of that. And then I have the dripper in the afternoon. If the for whatever reason, the misting and the fogging didn't take in the morning, well, then the chameleon would have the dripper in the afternoon. So that's why in the Chameleon Academy uh, recommended hydration schedule, I have all of this. I have three backups uh, or well, one main, two backups. And that is specifically not because I think the chameleons need that, but it's that way. So if everybody out there is implementing it, they can implement one or two things wrong and the chameleon still gets hydrated. Once you start getting a little bit more sophisticated and you start saying, instead of just following this recipe and this procedure, I am going to start, I'm savvy enough, experienced enough that I can look at the poop and I can start measuring things. You can start taking things away and it's not a danger to your chameleon because you are measuring their hydration. And I 
it is likely you will find that you can take away the dripper and the mister and end up with just the fogger. But for those of you who are starting this, you're not probably not going to feel doing it because this is totally foreign for us human beings. Go ahead and use all three methods. And once you're comfortable, you can start playing with taking away the dripper and seeing if the poop changes. You're, you're, you're experienced enough that you, now you're measuring things and now you're feeling confident that you can gauge your chameleon's health level and hydration level. Uh, and then you can start playing around with it. And so that is what I would say to you. Uh, take a look at your situation. Do you need it? And only you can answer that. Uh, so that would be my my response to this. Uh, anything any of you guys would like to? I guess I just wanted to mention that um, doing rainfall or doing misting or doing dripping um, may have its own thing that's important. Um, we don't know. Um, it rains in the nature, in the environment. It, maybe it washes stuff off. Maybe it cleans things. Maybe it's different than what it is for the chameleon to actually get hydration. So I wouldn't take them all away, um, but it can be intermittent. It doesn't have to be consistent. It doesn't rain every day, even in Madagascar or other parts of the world where it's, it's there's rainy and dry seasons. Um, maybe there's reasons for that as well. So think about emulating the nature, natural environment and think about what is it like? Is there a rain season? Is there a dry season? What's the difference? Why is it that way? We don't know. And we're still learning. So um, I would say the, the answer to the question is, um, I would say you're inclined to do that. I would continue doing it until we learn more. Um, but it's probably not a hydration technique at this point. It's probably just something else. And we don't even know if, it, if there's positive to that or not. We're, we're still not down that road far enough. And uh, we got a long way to go before we get to that point. I, I think that's a great point because, and the whole reason why we're going to fogging in the first place is because we trust that going as close to the natural condition as possible is going to be better for our chameleon. So even though we have chameleons right now that look like they're healthy, I'm still asking questions about the dry season and not because I want to dehydrate our chameleons half the year, but because what is there something about the dry season that is useful uh, for the chameleons that gives them a rest that can extend their life. And so I, I think, yeah, Sean, you make a good point. Uh, it is worth going towards the natural condition specifically because we don't know everything that we need to uh, implement. And that only by going towards the natural condition, will we figure those things out. I think that helps to answer the next question as well. That someone, uh, asked about fans and uh there's wind in the environment everywhere else except for our houses so um adding a fan and i, I add a fan that for my whole room that goes on and off and actually um you know it, it blows across the whole room and i have it running in different ways at different times of the year um it helps when it's too humid in there and it um it helps to dry things out and keep the mold from coming so um, I don't know if you have to have a, an individual fan on a specific cage. Um, I think air movement's important, but um, you can also do too much air movement. So it's a, it's a balance as well. It's one of those uh, one of those questions that we I don't know that we know the answer to that. Bill, um, I have fans in all of my cages, um, and they all kick on um, in the afternoon. Um, I run them all the way up until the end of the day. And then I also do a light schedule where I have a small light come on in the beginning, brighter light, and then a third light comes on in the afternoon, which simulates daytime. So I try to replicate uh, nature as much as possible. So I agree with you, Sean. I think, um, you know, I'm still keeping my misters, um, but I don't have them on regularly. I don't use them for drinking. They're more to simulate maybe a rainforest type environment. Um, so I have them sporadically coming on throughout throughout the week actually um but the fans i think are, are a big key because it dries everything out um and my fans literally will dry my cages entirely during the day um so when i start my fogging schedule at night we just go through the same process i don't like the fact that you may end up with bacteria and um, the things that go along with too much moisture, mold, et cetera. So I think the fans are a key to hybrid cages by far. Okay. 
Uh, Peter, your video went off. Uh, can you still? Are you still audio? Okay, all right. Just want to make sure because this this question's a uh, a good one for you. Uh, so Ruth is bringing up a good point that many people are going to have this question. So saying they get hydrated during fogging, okay, that's fine. We'll take that. But they also get hydrated during misting. So uh, they're getting hydrated either way. Uh, is it? Uh, should we care? The uh, and I know Peter, you touched on this. Yeah, I let's go ahead this, and so address I, this I again. Mean, yeah, look, uh, uh, as as we always uh, 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 try to discuss the things as deep as we can, we uh, we get as deep as we can, and then we have to confess we don't know. Yeah. Uh, well, in many cases, I do not know the ultimate answer, but I tend to collect enough data to be at least safe at saying, well, up to that level, I know. Up to this level, I don't know. This is first statement. Second statement is, you know, if it comes to the naturalistic approach, people often misunderstand one thing. We do not copy paste nature. Uh, we selectively and wisely copy paste those factors that we believe based on uh, observation based on evidence based on science that are uh, vital it means that help the chameleon to increase their wellness and to survive okay and we of course uh, eliminate for the sake of uh, ethics uh, because uh, like keeping chameleons in the uh, captivity is a matter of ethics we eliminate those factors which are out there in the wild but are lethal. It means cause the suffering and death of the chameleon. Yeah. So uh, again, people say, "Are you you want to have all the conditions of, of the nature?" No, we don't. We don't. Uh, we don't extra uh, simulate blizzards. Okay. Despite of the fact, every second months they happen in the environment. Yeah. We do not infect our uh, captive chameleon specifically with bacteria, with uh, with uh, uh, pests and and with uh, with parasites. Despite of the fact they are naturally inside of their bodies out there in the wild. Yeah, we do not introduce uh, cats and dogs and uh, uh, ferrets and whatever animals to their cages to simulate predation on them. Yeah, so the the simulation <coughs> is limited and is actually focused on their welfare, on their wellness, on their survival at the first level, at the second level, on their really like well-being and being able to, to exhibit all the natural uh, uh, like um, uh, behavioral patterns from eating to defecating to uh, basking to reproducing and, and, and to dying. Yeah? And we we raise the uh, raise the level of our ambition even to to create such an environment where they can sustainably long term reproduce building a good quality genetic material in the captive environment this is our ultimate ultimate goal yeah? so not replicating not copy pasting but wise and really intellectual work on what we select to, to, to use and what we select not to use. Uh, I have seen in the wild the cast chameleon, the Atriocerus henelai, drop down from the branches at minus two degrees. Okay? And they were so uh, frozen that I thought they are dead. Okay? In the morning, I, I found them at the, 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 the ground at minus one. They were still like that. And at plus uh, two, they were slowly running around. And, and at plus five, they were shooting small insects. Okay? Do I say, put the uh, Henelis, please, every night to a uh, freezer? I don't. Why? Because I know that it is extreme. Okay? So let us let's be wise. Let us really like uh, find, uh, find the, the, the proper amount, the proper balance. Uh, in order to let them really thrive. So, uh, if you if you ask me, uh, uh, so if there is any uh, way how I can get the uh, chameleons hydrated, is it not actually uh, up to me doing like that or not? I say, hey, 
from if you have like several options then let us let us uh, go, uh, go through them critically and say should i should i not okay i have started my speech about hydration with uh, how we gain uh, moisture into the hamlin body and as stated at first the source of hydration is actually food okay should i feed chameleons to hydrate them and the obvious answer is yes of course yes of course can i find you i say yes of course you know sometimes if you see they are overhydrated yeah then use small dubia and, and use crickets that you have not uh, put to a source of water for one or two days yeah so that you are you you provide less moisture moisture in their bodies if you see that the chameleon is uh, dehydrated one of the good options is from time to time to use the horn worms yeah, the larvae the caterpillars of, of the um, of, of the moths yeah because they uh, their uh, body content of water is exceeding 90 percent so you feed them actually a, a small sack of water yeah do it of course so hydration method uh, feed uh, with with feeders is is to be okay yeah second is it okay to uh, to fog the chameleons to gain uh, to gain hydration and i say yes of course because it seems based on all the research that has been done and all the i can now say thousands of experiments that have been conducted in the captivity that it has no downsides and has positives and it happens daily and it provides a substantial part of the hydration so for hydration i say yes second if i uh, if i say the chemists can lick uh, droplets of water and use uh, uh, for hydration liquid water should i go for it or not well i say if you have other options don't go for that because this is what we observe me both uh, me, me in the wild and uh my colleagues in in, in captivity yeah everyone that uses properly uh, fogging sooner or, or later comes to the conclusion that the chameleons stop drinking liquid water so don't push them to drink liquid water despite of the fact it is a valid hydration method why because it has downsides and why because you have an alternative which is much better much more natural and and uh, uh, has, has no risk you know should i use um, metabolic gain uh, it's not up to us <laughs> this is decided by the chameleon itself and by its physiology so this is like a, a model of the thinking if you ask these types of questions you know how to get the proper answer it is not black and white it is it is the whole environment to, to consider and to say okay uh, what is better what is what is balanced uh, should i not uh, um, provide more uh, varieties if, uh, if yes okay go for it uh, should i should i keep them uh, if it's a very tiny uh, animal which is very fragile should i not like better keep them under conditions which uh, seems to fit yes of course you decide we have one big privilege as humans uh, we have almost all the uh, abilities like chameleons <laughs> But we have a little bit bigger brain, so please let us use it. Let us use it. Yeah, and I'll say this is this question touches on is what we have right now good enough? Are we done learning about chameleon husbandry with mm -hmm. what we have been doing for the last 10, 20 years? Uh, because we've been able to reproduce panther chameleons reliably, multi generationally, are we done? with chameleon husbandry and nothing else matters. Uh, and so, I mean, obviously there's a lot of people in the community that are saying, yes, we're done. I am an expert in what I know now and I don't wanna hear anything more. And uh, especially with fogging, you're gonna get a lot of pushback, uh, especially from <laughs> breeders and experts and admins who are saying misting is the way to do it. Nobody wants to change and in in reality i don't want to change just for the sake of changing either my mission here is to push our husbandry closer to nature on the logic that that is ideal husbandry for the chameleon 
if they don't drink liquid water in the wild as a main source of hydration, I don't want to stop at that point, even though we're able to raise chameleons uh, apparently healthy uh, with missing systems. I don't want to stop at a missing system if I know that there's something that is more natural. And that's the whole reason why I'm bringing up this fogging in the first place. It's the whole reason why I've hounded Peter to explain this. And and it's, you guys may not know this, but we Peter and I had our first published interview in 2018. But he and I had been going on about this back and forth for years before that. And I've been tri uh, you know, asking all these questions because I need to, why do we change? There's crazy ideas that come out every, all, all the time. This is social media, it's wonderful. You got all sorts of really great ideas that come out and they, oh my goodness, they sound so authoritative when they're presented. But most of them are, we'll, we'll just say not, not they, don't, they don't go the distance. They don't take us closer to cap, uh, the, the natural condition they make it easier for us and and you know you you get people who start talking about how it's good to have sterile cages and plastic plants and uh and what <laughs> and little uh, little cups for the chameleons to drink out of what <laughs> they are excelling in is figuring out the minimum necessary to keep the chameleon alive healthy apparently healthy and reproducing that's the minimalistic and what you're finding is what is the low uh, what is the easiest way that we can get away with keeping these chameleons that's within their tolerance zone that's a totally different philosophy than what i'm doing here on the chameleon academy what peter's doing is we're wanting to find the most natural condition because that is going to be the ideal husbandry and i think the even though we look at what we're doing now and we're saying okay these panther chameleons look healthy the reason for going forward is we don't know what we don't know and we're not going to find out what we don't know until we keep exploring towards the natural condition and the panther chameleon and the veiled chameleon are very poor representatives of chameleon husbandry. They are, they will accept uh, conditions that are outside the tolerance range of other, other species. I mean, as I say, veiled chameleon, if you go away from the weekend, they will break into your liquor cabinet and steal your whiskey. <laughs> the things that they can <laughs> deal with are way beyond what something like a Columa linotum can deal with and Christatis. And so the reason why it's important to push beyond what is creating healthy panther chameleons is there's 200 other species out there and they're not going to accept the same kind of tolerance range that panthers and veils are. And so we're doing this because we want to know chameleons better and we don't want them to have to adjust to our world and our convenience, it is our responsibility to adjust and give them the ideal conditions. And the only way we're going to know what those are is by studying the natural condition. So that's... All right. Um... Oh, well, uh, let's see. Is there any way? I, I don't know. Do we need to look at? Uh, well, Peter, what do, you, what do you guys think about kidney? Or Sean, you're a doctor. That would be invasive. I mean, we'd have to look at blood work. And uh, I don't know that we need to get that invasive. I think that if we look at the, the way they their poop is, how they eat, how long they live, and what their behavior is like, I think that would be, you know, we don't test everybody, every human's kidney function all the time. We don't do urine samples on, even on them, even though that's not as invasive. Um, we just assume that they're doing okay because of other things. So um, I would say... Um, that that would be that 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 might be worthwhile for an experiment if we want to prove something but what are we trying to prove um i guess the the whole thing is what what, what would be the is is it proved that they're hydrated no i think that 
it would prove that, um, that their kidneys are functioning well. Um, that doesn't even mean that they're well hydrated. Um, it can be a whole bunch of other reasons why. So I think that um, looking at poop is probably the best example. It's not invasive. You just got to look at the poop. I mean, I know it's disgusting and everything, but um, that's that's where, where we're at. So I think that, uh, yes, that is a, a good suggestion. It's a good idea. But the only way to do that is to take a blood test and to get a blood test from a chameleon. <laughs> that would be, you know, we, we have enough trouble getting blood tests from humans that as well as chameleon. So um, I, 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 I think it's a great thought, but I think it's uh, probably um, something that's way outside the natural um, plan and the way to do things in life. Yeah. Okay. Look, like, uh, I, I absolutely second uh, what, what you say, uh, Sean. Uh, uh, on the other side, or the, not on the other, on the same side, actually, I would say if we have the opportunity and we do not harm the animal, we should go for it. Mm -hmm. And what I say is, you know, only while observing the, the uh, poop and the urine uh, during more and less fogging, we actually was able to set up the physiological norm for what we can uh, consider healthy and unhealthy. Yeah. So please watch poop and, and, and urine and then urates to, 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 get the, to get the idea. Second, if you have animals and you know their history, and even if you do not know that, yeah, lots of people do not, for instance, uh, give uh, uh, pay attention to uh, the sections, you know, once the animal dies, you know, it contains so much of, of, of valuable information that we can get out of it. And I'm so, so thankful to, to many of my colleagues and many of our breeders that come and say, Peter, uh, I'm so sad my chameleon has died, but please, could you find out what was the reason? I don't know. Was it, was it the kidneys? Yeah. Was it liver? Or, or was it me? Uh, killing the chameleon uh, was it uh, an inborn disease that I, I had nothing to do and I could not actually fix it right so it's so valuable to get inside and get as much non-invasive data as we can so that we can then you know make assumptions uh, that that again will be non-invasive uh, for um, it is it's very interesting but uh, for wrong kidney function actually a secondary very strange mechanism is uh, is quite quite nice for, for observing it is the swellings you know of course in general whenever there is a swelling then then kidney is involved you know because the, the water balance is, is is wrong yeah and in chameleons uh very often uh in uh, those specimens that were for instance wrongly supplemented with too much uh, phosphorus or wrongly fed with too much of adult insects that yeah? means the phosphorus calcium ratio was not proper it means we can expect kidney failure they develop a, one very interesting feature along the spine yeah uh, at the place where the lateral uh, 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 like um, uh, we call it um, uh, processes lateral processes of the vertebrae are present you find a tiny um, swelling which looks like a, uh, like a finger okay if you if it is there and you can then observe the animal while it was dying and you dissect it and you find out a kidney failure then you can you can say this is what you what you look for and uh, it is uh, it is then very nice to see uh, that even tiny things that I collected over these decades of fine and, and really uh, uh, finest details observations then come up as a good diagnostic material. I'm total with you, Sean, not to take unnecessary blood samples because even in the biggest species, you know, it is so invasive that the chameleon can die just because of that. We simply do not have so small needles not to cut the vessels uh, the half, you know. And uh, I remember just, just one month ago, I had an incident here in Czech Republic when uh, one of my, my beloved colleagues uh, like, uh, really, uh, like cried her eyes off while he, her uh, beautiful blue panda was dying because the idiot veterinary uh, doctor has uh, taken the blood for the sampling. But 
he needed too much. So what he did, he took so much blood that the comedian died because of losing the entire <laughs> volume of blood that was not able in the weakened uh, condition to uh, reconstruct and then recover from that. that space. Uh, and then, then explain me what a sense does this type of research have, you know? We cannot go too deep to, to kill the animal to find out, you know? We are, we are out of these dark ages of, of uh, biology, you know, uh, putting, I don't know, um, uh, uh, poisons in the eyes of of of, uh, of rabbits and so on, and we cannot do it to our beloved chameleons as well. Yeah. On the other side, any valid data, any valid dead body is a source of so valuable information that we can then use for non-invasive uh, diagnosis and treatment. And this uh, what, what is what I would definitely uh, heavily advocate for. Okay. So here here's the kind of response we're going to be getting a lot from the established community. How sad to be thirsty and not allowed to drink. Average home cannot be kept at such a low temperature, especially in the South. Yes, why recreate survival when we should provide thriving? Shame to force. Samantha, uh, we have just spent an hour talking about, two hours talking about how the chameleons are not thirsty, how this hydrates them so that they ignore the water that we're providing them. Yes, this is different than what we've been doing for the last 25, 30 years. Yes, it is difficult to wrap our heads around. But what test would you need to show that this is working? Uh, this may be new to you and the number of breeders around the world and admin facebook admins that are experts in this but fogging has been done for decades uh you can go you can listen to uh, my podcast in 2018 where i interviewed mary uh, mario youngman he's been fogging for i think got 10 years at this point peter and i have been talking about it since 2018 Sean and James have listened to that. They're the second generation of this fogging wave, and they have used it successfully. There will be a third generation that is listening to what Sean and James have been saying, and we will have more and more people build on generation to generation to generation, and it's your decision at what point you want to accept which how, how far which generation which wave do you want to accept that this is actually working and you can hold back as long as you want to and go kicking and screaming all along the way but this is something that works and i mean you can do it yourself people can do it themselves anybody here can do it and people will and it's just going to and people are, and i know we've got a lot of people here and and everybody who's listening if you're going to try it realize that you're going to get a lot of pushback from people who don't want to do something different and they want to reject for whatever reason they want to reject the new ideas every everybody has their own reason and i've heard a lot of very crazy things um but you're you're going to run into that and that's just part of being uh, with something new but the thing is we're not doing this because it's new and because we're bored with misting we're doing this because it answers a lot of questions we have that misting still it doesn't answer peter you have a friend i have a friend here and uh, you know it is always uh, like to uh, to show people at least you know indications of uh, what you are talking about you know um, uh, it is not a proof but uh, let me introduce you one of my like big prides you know i am nowadays the only person in the world that keeps a good genetic lineage in uh, captivity of this species this is the arabian chameleon the closest relative to the beloved 
Yemen chameleon, Camelo arabicus. This is about uh, seven months old uh, specimen. It's, it's absolutely like fabulous and perfect. It is exactly the same as if you would find it now in southern Yemen or in Oman. Okay. And it has not seen any drop of liquid water in his entire life for seven months. Okay. This is a perfect animal which will reproduce this fall. I'm, I'm, I'm sure for that. And this is one of the proofs, you know, that that this works. We are, my goodness, not uh, not uh, torturing our animals uh, to to prove something. On on contrary, I am the one always to find the uh, ethical and very gentle ways how to how to uh, provide proofs without killing animals, without you know dissecting them, without milking their blood and so on, so that we see it, so that. Uh, I just uh, like second what you Bill said. Uh, the the name of the game, of course, is go safe. But safe means equal to those conditions in the wild, which provide such an environment in which the animals can really thrive and feel properly. And and we have the benchmark up there. So uh, this is just one of the proofs that it works. No single drop of water. And if I would missed now the, the cage, the animals would not drink because they do not need it. It is not torture. It is not to provide something which is unnecessary. If you feel unsafe, Samantha, Kim, uh, Sean, whoever, okay, please go for our recommendations that that uh, Bill uh, vocalized so strongly. Yeah. We are far from telling you, do fogging and nothing else. We are far from telling you that. And Sean, James will 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 uh, for sure uh, say say the same. You know, yeah. We just in the conditions that we that we uh, found out, we do not see any necessity to do so. Yeah. While we were trying it, we were of course offering our animals all the alternatives. And we are switching them slowly by slowly down to see whether there is a difference. And if we found there is no difference having a dripper, okay, then we switched it off for, for a week, for two weeks, for, for three months, and then for one year. And it is if it's not necessary, not necessary in our conditions, then we can allow ourselves to switch it off. Same like we can stop spraying, uh, like we can stop misting and so on. Go safe, of course, prepare our alternatives for the for the chameleons so that in case that something does not work they have an alternative but when they do not use it for a long period of time then you are almost sure without dissecting it and without you know milking it uh, and so on and so on that that the, your decision was wise and was was fine and then discuss with people like me i'm not the only one that that uh, observes chameleons in the wild but I may be the craziest one <laughs> and and maybe one of the the uh, most eager to share, uh, discuss with the people that are uh, like experienced in in uh, seeing the animals in the wild and take the scientific and practical conclusions. What it means for the for for the husbandry, and then build build your your um, opinion on, on on that wisely. Yeah, and I'd like to add to that. This whole presenting of fogging is not meant to say. Everything that we're doing now is bad and you need to change. We're not starting a new gang here. Uh, you don't have to jump to fogging to, to be part of the cool kids club. Uh, do what you're comfortable with. And if you're not comfortable with trying fogging, don't do it. There, it, there will be uh, more people than James and Sean who will now become comfortable with it, they will try it. And then there will be more people after that. You can get on the train whenever you feel like getting on the train or don't get on the train at all. Just, just watch what's going on. What we're doing here is we are, I mean, the, the, the whole point of the Chameleon Academy, the whole point of why I have this show and the whole point of why I bring someone like Peter on is we want to learn more about chameleons and I'm going to share with you what I have found. This isn't something new. 
Obviously, I've been doing it for five years now and I've been talking about it for longer than that. And I bring on people who've been doing it longer than five years. They've been doing it 10 years, 15 years. This is to present to you information and you can incorporate it as you want to. Uh, the only thing that I would say is harming the community are the people that are rejecting new information because they don't want because they don't like Peter, they don't like me, or they they don't like that they've spent five, ten years, three months being an expert, and now they have to change. Uh, those, those are the wrong motivations. If you don't want to embrace this, then don't. But don't be the roadblock to other people advancing. And the second part is, once again, there is nothing magic about having a fogger. What is important is you understand what we're trying to accomplish with fogging, what part of the natural uh, environment we're trying to replicate, and that's what's important. There's nothing magic about a fogger. It's just a tool that allows us to recreate that. If you've got natural conditions, if you've got another tool, that's fine. What's important is not the equipment, it's about the end result. And I'm hoping that you pick up on what the end result is. I don't care how you get there. The end result is what we're looking for. Uh, so if you want to get involved with fogging, and, and this is this is big on my mind, and you'll, have to say, you'll know that I have a lot to say on this, is because through the Chameleon Academy, I specifically try to take these things and condense them into something that is easily replicatable by people in the community. Me coming out with fogging right now, it's actually, I'm a little bit nervous about this because I know how to make it work. I don't know all the ways that people are gonna screw it up. And <laughs> that everything, just because I can make it work, doesn't mean that it is gonna work for everybody. I am able to have a, a uh, multiple species able to be grow up healthy with no vitamin A deficiency using just calcium and whatever I gut load for the uh, for the uh, insects. But I don't know why other people have vitamin A deficiency. And so you see in my care guides, I always have a multivitamin that has preformed vitamin A even though I can do it without it, but I can't figure out why other people can't. So it's there. And this is the same situation with fogging. I don't know the ways that other people are going to do it and will actually harm their chameleon. And if you all, please, everybody who is listening to this, this is a growing topic. And especially for me in the Chameleon Academy, I have now a fogging page that I just released but I need to continue developing it. And so if you are fogging or you want to try fogging, I want to know your experiences. What worked for you? What didn't you understand? And especially what didn't work for you? Because I may be implementing it in a way that I just assume everybody knows not to put the fogging hose directly on the baby's head. I, I didn't think about that. But somebody out there could literally easily say, oh, OK, fogging is good. I want to make sure the baby gets the fog and puts it too close to the baby. All good intentions, not not a stupid thing at all. But I need to know that people are thinking like that so I can put in a warning. Hey, wait, wait a minute. Make sure that the fogging is not directly hitting the baby. And you know why I knew or why I specifically am harping on that is because somebody came to me and said, hey, listen, this is what I did, and it really it gave my babies respiratory infection. Ah, okay. I, I better do something about that. And that makes total sense. Babies are in smaller cages, so we put a fog hose, a fogger hose there. That those two combined, it's trouble. Please give me feedback. If you try fogging, give me feedback in what worked and what didn't work, and that's going to help me be able to present that in a more effective way as we go on. Because 
we're at the beginning. We're at the beginning of the mass uh, mass community adopting this. And so things are going to happen. Uh, let's see. I will go by and I will see uh, if there's any more questions. We should start bringing this to a close. Um, if anybody has, let's see. Uh, we're going to have to uh, bring it to a close. Uh, Samantha's still having problems with this. Uh, let's see. Well, okay. Well, let's, let's bring it on. Uh, uh, all right. Uh, Peter, I'm, I'll, uh, I, I'm going to have to go through the, uh, the, the chat and, and see what else is there. So you want to, uh, uh, something about fighting cannot be done in all environments. Yeah. Look, let me be the bad guy now. Uh, and it's not now directed to Samantha. It is directed to the text. Okay? So to, not to be, to not be offensive. I, I'm, I'm not never offensive. And it's never my, my intention. Look, I have to be here black and white. Okay? Uh, it is about the ethics. And the ethics is not about what the chameleons owe to us, but what we do owe the chameleons that were taken from their beautiful uh, green flush, uh, full of water, full of fo fog, full of insects, uh, dry season, uh, winter season, um, uh, rainy season uh, formed environments and were enslaved and put to cages in the captivity. Okay. We are those in depth of these small creatures and we are obliged to at least this is my faith and this is my deepest belief to do whatever it uh, we can and whatever it takes which is realistic now based on money investment based on based on time based on uh uh technical and uh, and logistics uh logistic uh, features and so on that we provide the best possible environment for the chameleons. In European law, it is actually the only way how to keep any kind of animal and not providing an uh, environment which allows the animal to fully exhibit its natural needs is considered against the law and in my uh, opinion, it's, of course, uh, against the ethics, which is less than a law. So to be black and white and rude, I would say either you can afford uh, providing to your beloved chameleons what they need, and then you can uh, be so privileged and honored to owe one and spend time with it and study it and enjoy its presence in your home, or you are not able to provide the proper uh, environment, then please don't keep it mm. because this is unethical. You know, it is, it is tricky now because you can buy a uh, wild chameleons for 15 bucks and you can buy a, 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 a panther eggs for, I don't know, 20 bucks. And it seems that the money uh, is like so cheap that we don't need to pay attention but you know uh, we have here colleagues that that keep like like james uh he knows how many hundreds and thousands of dollars it it <laughs> needs money's not pay. an object <laughs> yeah well yeah it's the, that you have you have the value you have a real the, the real value i i don't care for me every single life has the same value and it is the absolute value of course we need to care for them maybe in the case of the more fragile and more expensive uh, species it is a little bit more understandable for the for the general public you know that if you care for a chameleon that has a value of five thousand dollars that you the hell bring a cage which which costs you one thousand because it is okay you know but you need a cage for that amount of money also for something which you can can get for free from the from the pet store because they do not know what to what, what to do with it uh and uh our obligation is yeah to care for the animal because it cannot care for itself so we need to go that mile and you need to go that 
extra miles to to make them comfortable, to make them survive, to to, to give them what they need to thrive and reproduce in the in, in the in, uh, like artificial environment that we provide for them. And our discussion, and, and I love the way how Bill uh, is, is, is putting the logical bridges uh, between things and elements of the naturalistic uh, chameleon culture, the, the breeding and keeping of chameleons. Let me let me again be a little bit the devil advocate, and let's take it from the other side. You know, we we uh, have the privilege to keep uh, at one side the most. Uh, Forgiving chameleon species like wild chameleons, panther chameleons, uh, maybe uh, Jacksons, but Jacksons are not that that, that uh, uh, easy uh, again, and so on. Uh, and we think that uh, if we model uh, the environment for this species well enough, that it is enough. And uh, then we have the discussion: uh, uh, should we or should we not use the fogging? And it's uh, uh, can we skip it and can we replace it with something and so on. Let us start from the other side. Yeah, I have uh, I have shown you uh, one uh, quite fragile species uh, just a couple of minutes ago, and I can show you the freshly hatched uh, uh, Brocchesia tili that I have in in my laboratory. I cannot bring it now. Yeah, it is it, if it sits, it sits on the top of my finger. You know, and in that case, please, there is no discussion whether you will or will not have a, a fogger. To make it survive because if you do not have the fogger it will not survive okay same uh bill mentioned kaluma leonotum kaluma leonotum is that big okay and it lives in monte and d'ambre and it lives it starts to live where pardalis stops if it comes to the altitude okay they start at about 1000 meters high at the 1000 meters high i guarantee you in madagascar you will freeze even if you have a long sleeve and are, are very well well uh, equipped with with uh, all what you need to to work in 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 the jungle and this is such a tiny alien and you cannot keep it without fogger if you if you do not give him fogger it will die yeah panther chameleon can maybe survive but this is not the way it is not the way to, to provide the uh, pardoning chameleon species less and to give the more sensitive ones more. We need to go these extra miles and learn more and more so that even for those, we believe we have already cut the edge of like the plus minus compromise survival rate, yeah? That we can say, oh, and even for this species, we can go further and we can provide more and we need to rethink how we actually treat them. Getting back again to the ethics, if you can do it and if you want to do it, if you are eager to do it, if you want to invest, if you if you are ready to do so, please go that miles. And if you are not capable, if you do not want to invest the money, if you cannot have lower temperature in your damn apartment, please go <laughs> to the sorry. Thank you, James. <laughs> that was the part I just didn't understand. Why? Why can't you get your temperatures down? I mean, there's this thing called air conditioning. I just, I, sure. I, I didn't understand that at all. Okay, we are going to have to bring this to a close. <laughs> uh, Sean, I've been able to mimic everything, so I don't understand why she couldn't get her temperatures down. It, it's pretty easy to get to 65 and use your fogger. I, I, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> All right, John, do you have any uh, any closing comments? Uh, just, uh, you know, think about this, put it in perspective, and um, it doesn't have to be the only thing that you do. Um, you can keep everything else that you're doing on and use it, and you'll find that over time you'll stop um, misting and, and dripping because you just don't see it being used anymore. But you don't have to do it. Um, but you do have to take good care of your chameleon and fogging is probably one of the things that they actually need and do naturally in life so um i think you should consider it at least okay james um yeah i didn't know there was so much passion against not fogging so i was a little kind of thrown away by that part of it but uh you know i implemented it kind of on a wing didn't really 
use anybody else's advice, but common sense tells me that this is how it works. I mean, all you have to do is watch the weather patterns of Madagascar, look at the weather patterns in your own cities, look at the weather patterns at the beaches. Um, I mean, it all makes sense. This is, it's not even rocket science, and I'm not a scientist. I'm not Pitar. I don't, you know, <laughs> I'm not Peter. I don't. I, I haven't done this all my life. I just understand how things work, I guess. And it's common sense. It really is. It's total common sense. If you use common sense in all of this, it's going to bring you to this conclusion, I think. Okay. And, and Peter, I know you just got done uh, sharing a whole lot, but we'll go ahead and uh, give you a chance to have uh, final words. Yeah, let me not be the, the, the last one. You know, <clears throat> it is it is such a joy, you know, to to see the chameleons striving. It is such a joy to observe them. And they give us so much of, you know, information, uh, insights, or, and, uh, and the learning. If, if you are open, you know, it is like, you know, to read a book, just to, to stay in front of a cage and, and, and feed them and observe them and, and see them thriving and developing. Uh, that uh, uh, I always uh, feel like uh, being in debt uh, to them and, and whatever I do, I always say, "Hey, uh, uh, can, can I can I do more?" And uh, this is mm -hmm. what what uh, is actually the engine of, of my sharing and and my being uh, sometimes a little bit black and white and sometimes uh, being uh, loved by some and and not uh, so much liked by by the others. You know, uh, I, I don't do pay, pay attention to that. My mission is clear in, in in that direction. You know, I'm here for those good people that want to listen and and have a similar set of, of uh, values as, as i am and i'm here for chameleons to serve them because i owe them this this one uh, one of the nicest and, and and best factors how we can actually long term assess whether we are doing well or not is the longevity it is not a panacea yeah it is not the ultimate one but it is one of the very good ones you know and i have just uh, read through the uh, through some comments like uh, we have never missed it a chameleon and, and it's uh, uh, survived for 70 years as a wild chameleon yes this is exactly what you do uh the the care for for such a gentle creature like chameleon is means it has a longevity span and this is the maximum one if you don't fork, cut two years. If you if you feed uh, improper uh, insects, cut two years. If you do not uh, have a proper supplementation schedule uh, with good ratio with of, of uh, calcium and and, and phosphorus, uh, cut three years. You know, if you do not provide them a winter time and and rest, cut one year. If you do not uh, provide them whatever, and and this is how it really works. You know, all these compromises we allow ourselves cut their lives. Yeah, it is same like uh, I will not now advocate uh, not not, not uh, smoking, for instance. But every smoker should know that every single cigarette brings him closer to death. Okay, it is objective fact. One cigarette means nothing. Two cigarettes means nothing. But the accumulative effect, you know, shortens the life. And it's obvious if you if you uh, if you smoke one cigarette per year or you smoke one cigarette per hour that it has a tremendous uh, influence on your on your lifespan. So if there are people saying, "Oh, I have kept my chameleon for years," it is seven. So be aware that there are some wild chameleons that survived 16 years in the captivity. Be aware, James, if you keep your wonderful Parsons chameleons, yeah, that. The the uh, the life expectation is much over 16 years. Uh, actually, there are some uh, specimens, and you might know it, living in the in the United States, which are still reproducing, and they have reached a year uh, the the, the um, uh, age of 16 years. And uh, Olaf Pronk, uh, which has suddenly died uh, a couple of uh, years ago, uh, uh, was an expert on on uh, the wild. Uh, fauna of Madagascar and flora of Madagascar, uh, and he was a fan of uh, of the uh, noble king of the jungle, the Parsons chameleon. Expected actually, based on his studies, that they might exceed 35 years. You know, so imagine how long and 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 uh, nice can be the life of a chameleon if we do care, and how we uh, uh, um, unpromisably you know, uh, skip 
minutes and years and uh, decades of their lives if he don't care. Uh, I'm I'm here to uh, to do whatever it takes uh, to motivate all people that, that uh, take Kimlin seriously to care. Please do cares. I do, and we at least we four here and uh, many uh, of you that have joined us. Uh, we see you care. Let us spread these tidings and let's spread this uh, philosophy to the to the community. Uh, we will be the ones still being in depth, but uh, we can do a lot of <laughs> good work. Thank you, and and I'll I'll close up from my side saying uh, this this is something that my life's mission is to push chameleon husbandry forward and it, it is driven by personal curiosity and a, a sense of perfection wanting the chameleon to know what what is best for the chameleon and the the end result is longevity of the chameleon and, and i fully realize that uh it, it's very difficult to measure uh, the life of a chameleon. And if somebody starts right now with fogging and all these other things that we're learning, uh, it's going to be what, 16 years until we know if it really works. And so there is a level of faith, it's logic, that we are doing things now that we aren't going to be able to pre uh, present absolute black and white peer-reviewed study proof that this works. And there, I, I'll just say that if that's what you need, then you're gonna be on the 10th wave and you will be totally certain that this works, but there's gonna be nine generations and waves of people doing it beforehand and their chameleons are going to be benefiting. Uh, and I also want to say with all humidity, humility, uh, when we're doing something new, we could be wrong. There could be wrong things about what we believe right now. Now, I will also say that we got to this point after five years of me doing it. You, Mario Youngman did it, well, I think it was 10 years or something by time I interviewed him in 2018. And so this show is happening because there's enough confidence in what this is to bring a public and say, all right, it's time for the general community to try it. I've got Sean and James on who are not Bill and Peter and we're doing this because we have great big egos and we want our own technique to call our own uh they're just doing it and so if you don't you don't want to listen to me peter i uh, you can listen to sean and james i mean yeah they're, they're nicer all around so well, what the heck you know peter I, I guess we're uh we're obsolete now we can retire and uh we can hang out on no, uh, no, no, on the no, beach no. of uh Nosy bay and uh let uh, Sean and no, James. No, I'm going to slither back into the. Uh, we're not going to start corners. that again, Bill. The last time you said you were going to retire 50. We need you guys out there allowed. in front. So um, we're not going to start that all over again. We, I don't know. I think you're looking for a uh, for a bunch of people say don't retire, but uh, you're never allowed to retire. So uh, uh, yeah, I'm not. You'd be surprised <laughs> what I'm really looking for. To kick me out. <laughs> So I, I want to be uh, hanging out on that beach with the margarita going, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, all right, everybody. And uh, to the everybody who's stuck with us, uh, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, please absorb uh, what you can here, ask questions, test it out, and give feedback and let us know. This is not – we're, we're – we're not to the end. This is this isn't all packaged up in a nice package. It's gotten to the point where it's time for other people to try it. And we need to come, we need to grow together as a community towards uh, better providing our chameleons what they need. And so uh, and with that, I'll say, everybody, thank you very much. And we'll see you later. Thank you, guys.